The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, we reveal directions for getting to Underhill to rescue Delitha Mirzatil, the Princess of Fairy, which are mainly that you take the Zarathan Express through the Gateway to Never, then hang a right two stars to the left, go straight on till morning to Midlothian, Texas, where the Austin chalk, which is just another word for fairy dust, is thickest. Sprinkle some on your shoulders and locate the cave in the quarry behind the cement factory, clap three times and say, I believe in the Marfa Lights, and you will be transported to the realm of the Havelina King, where Princess Mirzatil is being held by King Bor and his Varangian guard. And the latest entry in our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. We interview Reiki Spore on his new book Phoenix in Shadow this time, which is the sequel to Phoenix Rising and book two in the Balanced Sword Heroic Fantasy Trilogy. Reich discusses his enormous Zarathan world-building project and how the series fits in, plus why we should fear certain toads bearing swords and concussive grenades. And we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. It's read by Bronson Pinchot. Here's the news. Hey, out in May from Bain are two new trade paperbacks. First, we have Phoenix in Shadow by Reiki Spore. This is book two in the Balanced Sword series, a high fantasy heroic adventure series, and the sequel to Phoenix in Shadow. The Phoenix books are good high fantasy, good world building, magic that makes sense and has all kind of cool implications. They're also part of this huge uh, tapestry of cross-dimensional stories that Reich has created. So there's a flavor of other genres in there as well. Definitely anime, uh, contemporary cross-world fantasies, but still swords and paladins. And one evil enemy who is particularly well-drawn and slimy. We'll talk next to Reich about that. Also out in Omni edition is Gateway to Never, number six in the Collected Adventures of the John Grimes of the Galactic Rim series by A. Bertram Chandler. This contains Chandler's classic novels and collections, The Gateway to Never, The Dark Dimensions, and The Way Back. I read this Chandler series about a decade ago, and it is really a lot of fun. Space opera, some cool multiverse universe hopping stuff. It has a kind of a Star Trek cross with Treasure Island kind of feel to it. These were originally mostly published as serials in Analog Science Fiction magazine under the editorship of the great John W. Campbell, and you can jump into the series almost anywhere. Phoenix in Shadow and Gateway to Never are now out at booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome Reich E. Spoor to the podcast. Hi, Reich. Hi, how are you doing, Tony? Reich is the author of Bane books, uh, a lot of Bane books, including Digital Night, the Arenaverse novels, Grand Central Arena, Spheres of Influence, and there's going to be another one. Uh, do we have a title for that? Uh, the tentative title is Challenges of the Deep. Challenges of the Deep. Most recently, he is the author of Contemporary Fantasy Paradigms Lost, which is a, a very big extension of Digital Night. Um, that was uh, out in December. Cool book. It's uh, Digital Night is a contemporary fantasy, and it's a bit, got a cool version of vampires in it. With Eric Flint, he is the co-author of the hard science fiction Boundary series, including Boundary, Threshold, and Portal. And also now out at booksellers is Castaway Planet, which is set in the Boundary universe, but starts another story cycle there, and that was really enjoyable. We did a podcast with Reich and Eric about that. Reich is also the author of epic fantasy adventure Phoenix Rising, and now its sequel, which is out in bookstores everywhere and at booksellers everywhere, Phoenix and Shadow. Uh, Reich, also, you've been doing a, I think it's a Kickstarter project, uh, Polychrome. Can you tell us about what that is? I'd love to. Polychrome is a adult audience that is, you know, for adult readers, not for children, Oz-based novel, which actually takes the Oz can seriously, but tries to tell an adult adventure uh, in that setting. Uh, I sent it out to lots of publishers, and a lot of them looked at it for a while and decided that, well, we just don't quite know how to push this because it doesn't fit in the normal boxes of Oz books. So I kickstarted it, and it was a very successful kickstarter. I actually got to the stretch goal that allowed me to get nothing less than a Bob Eggleton cover. If you saw that one, I think you did. Yeah, yeah. It's a gorgeous piece of work. Very cool. And anyway, Polychrome is now uh, now finally out. It took me uh, longer than I thought, but it's finally 
finally out, uh, available both in hardcover, both in softcover, hardcover, and an ebook from uh, Amazon and uh, Lulu if you want the really, really, really fancy version. Uh, and also, I believe the ebook's available from Smashwords and iBooks and, and other places as well. Well, thanks for letting me talk about it since it's sure. not actually a beta book, so I appreciate it. Well, I mean, it sounds really cool. I, I It may not be, uh, we might not just have been the best publisher for it, but it sounds cool as hell, and I certainly want to read it. So, um, it, yeah, well, I'll send you a copy. <laughs> Verily do so. In many of your story universes, I'm not sure of the polychrome, but it's certainly in Phoenix and Shadow, um, you have the, this sort of interconnected giant fantasy landscape, science fiction as well. Can you explain Xerathan and its relationship to the rest of existence in uh, in your world? How did this vast and vastly old landscape for storytelling develop? Well, the germ of it really started simply because I started getting interested in writing when I was a kid. So I started kicking around ideas for what I could write. And of course, most of them just imitating uh, other authors, Stock Smith being one of the big ones. But when I started role-playing gaming in uh, 1977, of course, uh, I started as a player, but then I wanted to be a game master. I wanted to run for my own adventures. Well, you need a setting for that. And that was why I invented Zarathan. The name basically came as modification of Zarathustra because of the awesome piece of music also brought to Zarathustra, which was used for 2001. I didn't particularly like the movie, but that piece of music was just totally awesome. But then I started building it, and at first it was just, you know, a pretty much a fantasy clone of, you know, Tolkien and Robert E. Howard and everything, but then I started throwing more and more stuff into it. And I've always been a consistency junkie, and I realized just throwing things in there was introducing inconsistencies. And I started trying to say, okay, well, where did this come from? What does it mean, and, and how does it work? And I also didn't like having everything separate, you know, making a completely separate universe for my superheroes, for my science fiction, for everything. I said, well, you know, if you have a multiverse like Amber or um, any of a number of other uh, series, you could have everything in it. So I started building a grand unified uh, universe. Xerathan itself is, you know, my epic fantasy setting. That's where all the magical adventure tends to take place. Its direct relationship is it's sort of the keystone of the entire universe. Uh, Koros explains it um, in Phoenix Rising that, in a sense, it is all the fantasy universes you can think of overlaid on each other and if you can just learn how to view it properly you will see any fantasy universe that you want even though there is a sort of a central Xerathan, a real Xerathan underneath them all or above them all or around them all. It, it, you know, your extra dimensional things, it's hard to uh, put mere English terms mm. to it. Wow, that does sound very amber-like. And in a sense it is and it's quite deliberately so in the sense that I uh, specifically nod to amber by having Koros call his method of traveling that way shade striding instead of shadow walking, which is what, of course, the Ambrites call. But it's also rather different in the way in which it works. There, there is no, there's no one ruling the central world or able to control it. Natives of that world don't have any special relationship to the other worlds that they can access from it, except insofar as they themselves might be special beings. Um, and Zarathan itself is one of two great poles of reality, the other one being Earth. And again, there are are many, many, many Earths, but there's one true Earth. The true Zareth and true Earth are linked as poles that the the name of Earth in the ancient language is Saralandar, which means the world of magic, uh, not the world of science or knowledge or something of that nature, as opposed to Sarathan, which means the world of magic. Two of them used to be very intimately connected and were at the peak of their, uh, in the, the ancient days, they were connected and working well together and something severed that connection, which I believe we'll be discussing later. Uh, now, well, does that is that the Chaos Wars, or was that a, a result of the Chaos Wars that we hear about in uh, Phoenix and Shadow, or was that something totally different? Or, is, or, or more a result of it. What happened was that, uh, for various reasons, the King of All Hells, Kerlamion, decided that he didn't like the super-advanced civilization of Atlantea and its expansion into the rest of the galaxy, and the peaceful and advanced civilization of the dragons and their children, the Sauron. And he set up a very clever plan to destroy both of them simultaneously, one by, his, one by uh, manipulating people to destroy Atlantea's protections at the appropriate time so that he could cast a particular spell, and another by suborning one of uh, the Dragon King's closest support. The result of all this was to seal the conduit of magic that connected Earth and uh, Zarathan. 
this also prevented magic from getting to any other point in the universe, and since the Atlantean civilization was based on a integrated combination of magic, psionic powers, and technology, it was like suddenly shutting off electricity. The entire civilization collapsed instantaneously across the galaxy, one of the greatest disasters imaginable. Now, on Xerathan, the result of this was a shockwave. Now, we don't know, nobody knows why or how, but as a uh, author, I do, and I can tell you flat out that the Chaos Wars are a result of that closure being manipulated, the power of that closure being manipulated by yet another being who wanted something that would make sure that while civilizations could rise, they would never rise beyond a certain point. So every 12,000 years or so, the magical resonance comes back, incites people into a war, causes a chaotic resonance throughout the world, mystical power so great that by the end of the Chaos War, people don't even remember the past very well. Even the gods don't. They can remember very general things and rediscover stuff from the past by digging up the wreckage and everything, but they can't remember the details. So while there may be and are beings that are vastly old, even they mostly don't remember details of the ancient days. Huh. Remember scraps and bits and pieces, but it's hard to connect it to a coherent narrative. Well, shades of uh, that Asimov story, Nightfall, actually. <laughs> yes. Yes, although in this case, uh, it's not. they can't even keep written records in stone or something. Even the records are wiped for the most part. So tell us more about the, the magical beings, the Pantheon uh, for Zan- Zarathan, and how the gods interact and, and the, the demons and the devils. Why do they need champions, uh, for instance? <laughs> well... So you can have a story, yes. Well, well that's, that's the meta reason. The meta reason is then that way I, otherwise I'd have to be talking about what the gods do. But the fact is that if you look at the way in which they interact, gods worry about gods doing things. If you want to keep things working on the mortal level, it's generally you need the mortals to take to keep track of most of it. So if you yourself, you know, if you're you're busy dealing with keeping the balance in the godly realm, all you can do is supply some power to chosen beings to do most of the work. You only intervene once in a while when things get really desperate and when it's a situation you can just justify to the other gods and not get another one involved so you don't end up with a god versus god battle on the planet, which is a very dangerous thing, even for relatively low-level gods. The high-level ones, it's something absolutely you don't want happening. There are many, many, many different gods, thousands of them, ranging in power from beings that make somewhat hard work of beating a mountain down to ones that, if they want to, can trot out and create an entire universe and play with it like a baseball. At the time of the uh, Phoenix books, someone, we find out it's Carlanion and his group, have managed to manipulate the other gods into well, basically signing a non-interference pact, where the only way in which they can interfere is through their champions, their mortal avatars or priests, or in the, in the case of uh, Kyrie, the Justiciar is basically holy warrior. They also have to keep the uh, mortals pleased with them in one way or another, because many of them draw power from being worshipped, from being believed in, from being civil symbolic of whatever it is that they're supposed to represent. The more successfully they carry that out, the more the more the fact that they exist on Zarathan and, and represent this gives them power, because they're at, this, at the keystone of reality. So since they are sitting on that planet, it gives them power just from acting properly as a god. Mirianar, as a god of justice and vengeance, doesn't, have, doesn't even show a gender or a face, because they want to be purely just. And justice, uh, that means show no preference to species, show no free and special preference to sex, or even necessarily to whether or not you're a solid object or not. It's just a symbol, a symbol of, of justice and vengeance, and that's all it is. It doesn't show a face, it doesn't show a name. Uh, well, our um, human champion that Marion R. picks out is our heroine, Kyrie Vantage. She's called Phoenix, um, and she's a justiciar. Tell us about how, I think it's Evan Weil is the way the country's pronounced. It's a, it's a border country in this world of Zarathan, but it has a very peculiar structure of, uh, they're not exactly law enforcement they're there for they're sort of rangers right in a sense uh, the the pronunciation is actually evan will evan will uh, evan will um basically when mirianar showed up mirianar wanted the people who were both priests who preached the word and ones who were agents of justice and vengeance the priests would tell people you know the other aspect there's just basically there's four tenets which are um wisdom justice mercy and vengeance mercy comes always before vengeance in fact mercy is usually the first thing you think of although justice and vengeance are usually the aspects most people think of 
So the more tolerant aspects were assigned to the priests, the justice and vengeance were assigned to the holy warriors, the justiciars. The justiciars were given symbol, symbolic armor. They all have names of some form of bird, um, at least the original justiciars. And they would don this symbolic armor when they were chosen, and during the, con the con conduct of their duties are always referred to only by the name of the armor. Uh, that is, again, a symbol of justice. You are not talking to a person. You are talking to an agent of the god. And so they are the agents for the church. The Watchland, who is the ruler of the country, Evanwell, and he has his um, different levels of patrollers, enforcers, whatever you want to call them, the uh, eyes and the arms of the, watch, of the Watchland. Um, they are sort of the civilian arm, while the others, are, while the priests and the justiciars are the religious arm of the uh, country. Yeah. Well, Kyrie has read rescued Evan Will from some pretty evil corruption in Phoenix Rising. Not really a spoiler, but that's what the book, the book is about. Um, tell us about her character. One of the things that comes across is that she's pretty physically imposing. Yes, she's a very tall uh, woman. She stands about six foot two, six foot three. Uh, broad and quite muscular. Uh, one thing that may not get across, she's also very dark skinned. She actually looks, uh, I was envisioning her looking rather Polynesian in, uh, in appearance. We should mention there's a really cool uh, that Todd Lockwood cover on this book. I think it's a wonderful uh, composition. God, I love covers. <laughs> yeah. the, both both covers are gorgeous, but the lighting, of course, makes it difficult to see anyone's coloration because you know the one it's dark with fire all around, and the other one with she's on fire. The other one with her flaming wing. Kyrie's a, a vantage as well as being uh, Phoenix, one of the uh, Justiciar. Tell us about the family and her background, how she came to be Myrinar's uh, agent in this world. Uh, one of the eyes rank, uh, one of the high up uh, secondary nobility, essentially, in Evanwell. And her parents are killed mysteriously. Someone invades their home and burns to the ground, killing her parents, who used to be adventurers, which means that they themselves are not to be trifled, yet they were killed apparently quite quickly. No one getting a chance to uh, raise an alarm outside of it. So the first thing that anyone knew about it was when Kyrie, her brother Rion, and her sister Arel came back from a night away and saw the house on fire. So her brother, they both swear vengeance, but her brother dedicates himself to becoming a justiciar. He is older than she is, so he gets to go first anyway. And at the time, there was a unspoken but obvious uh, tradition that um, justiciars were male. He joins, and it's not a spoiler since we have Phoenix Rising has been out for more than a year, to say that eventually it's discovered when Rion is betrayed and murdered that the justiciars themselves have become corrupt. That's not discovered until after he is murdered, and Kyrie leaves. She leaves, she goes somewhere to, you know, figuring that maybe someone's after her family specifically, and then discovers through seeing a clue that she hadn't really interpreted properly before. She realizes this, goes out and demands to the god in a rather scream at the heavens way as to how how could a god of justice abandon them so badly as to allow this level of injustice? The god instead says, I have not abandoned you, says that there's much more behind it, and then says, but if you will believe in me, you will become the last true and only justice you are, and I will give you justice and vengeance if you hold true. She realizes that basically Miranar is saying, help me, I'm too weak to do this without your help, and accepts the uh, charge given to her. Well, she's, in Phoenix Rising, she's becoming this full ju justice you are. In, in Phoenix and Shadow, she's got her powers. Uh, there's some pretty cool powers. Can you give us a hint of what it means to be a champion of Miranar? Well, you can, you can you, see on the cover one of the things that you get. There's a lot of things you get. The, the You can pull the power of your god to just reinforce everything you do, so you can become faster, stronger, um, more resilient, you can defend yourself, you can shift your perceptions. So, if it's dark, you can suddenly see whether it, that's whether it's dark or light. Mirinar being a god of justice and vengeance also has a power of truth, so you can often see through lies, illusions, deceptions. You obviously see on the cover one that she has, which is that she can fly by getting wings of the phoenix. Most of the uh, justice yards could also fly by getting wings of one form or another. Each one of them also gets particular powers based on, on their own theme, so to speak. Kyrie being a phoenix, 
gets powers and even better powers of healing than most of them have. She gets powers of fire. Um, her sword is named Flame Wing for a reason, uh, since you can see it on both covers, it bursts into flame. She can gain other powers depending on the circumstance. She can basically pray to Mirinar and say, can you help me do this? And if it is on the cause of justice and vengeance, the god can choose to assist you in that. They're fairly open-ended. I mean, you're basically being the emissary of the god, and in her case, it's even more important. She's the only true emissary of the god, and therefore anything the god does has to go through her. So she's much more important as an, on an individual scale than uh, the Justiciars used to be, because there used to be more of them, and there used to be a lot more priests and all that. The actual faith now has been reduced to only one known temple of Marianar, and that's actually an important plot point in the overall scheme of things. Well, there's some, uh, because of her powers, there's some really cool action sequences in Phoenix and Shadow. I think my favorite parts are, are some of the, or the fight scenes, some of them. that You just have her do a lot of cool stuff. And the other characters, which we should talk about. She has two friends. Tobamar Silverrun is called the Exiled Prince. What is Tobamar exiled from or where? And what is the quest that he's been set out on? Tobamar is from a country called Sky Sand, and he is the seventh of seven, the seventh child of seven children and child of a seventh child herself. His mother was the seventh child of her own life. He had the misfortune or good fortune to get a reading at the temple of Tarion, which is their god, and the reading basically said, you've been chosen to go on this quest that only you, the ruling family, get to go on. Unfortunately, it also means exile, because the quest is to find their lost ancient homeworld, home, homeland, that world. The reason, of course, they don't know where it is is because this happened in one of the prior chaos wars. And, of course, their memory is gone and the records are gone. Unfortunately, there's a curse on their family that if they don't leave immediately, the forces that drove them from their original homeland, some form of that force will come down on the entire country. So he has to leave and go on his quest to search for his original homeland. He is not allowed to return for a full 24 years, um, unless, of course, he succeeds and finds the homeland. This has been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and none of his None of the prior ones have ever succeeded, and none of them have ever returned alive. He, I kind of picture him as a as an Errol Flynn type. I don't know. It's, it, he's swashbuckling. Are there any literary influences for for Tobamar that that you drew on? Yes, actually. Um, first of all, his um, setting is actually very um, Middle Eastern. You know, it's a desert kingdom sort of thing. He also is supposed to be very dark skinned, hawk like look. I always envision him as something from the from the uh, Sinbad mold. Although his style of combat and fighting is much more influenced by Wuxia martial arts movies, that kind of thing. So he's a very, very swashbuckling, as you say, but the uh, influence is much more Middle Eastern, Arabian um, kind of uh, vision. Yeah, he's so good that one sword's not enough for him. He's a two-sword user, and then he runs into another one. But that's because it's a theme with that particular style of combat. Um, also along in Phoenix and Shadow is my favorite character in the series, and I think maybe a lot of people's uh, sort of sentimental favorite, maybe. This Poplock uh, Duckweed. So what? A frog has a sword. Uh, why wouldn't he just be easy to squish anyway? First of all, Poplock instructs me to say, I am a toad, not a frog. A toad. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they're sort of racist that way. Uh, I'm very, I would not want to offend Pop Lock, actually. So. Well, he has a sword, and he uses it, and it's been, for one thing, that sword's been enchanted by Koros, although it took him a while before he found out who it was who put the enchantment on. So the sword actually hits something more like a full-size longsword swung by an adult human being. So that's one reason why you shouldn't sneer at that sword. He is also much tougher than he looks. The intelligent toads are very tough creatures. Certainly he's not on the level of a human being, but proportionally he's tougher than a human being is. So any individual hit really has to get him pretty well before it's going to do serious damage to him. More importantly, though, he thinks. He thinks more than any of the other two. He is possibly, aside from one particular character in Phoenix and Shadow, and one particular character in the sequel that I turned into you guys, Phoenix Ascendant. Coming next, Bree. the smartest person that you encounter. Yeah, I mean, that's what's so fun about him, is that he is clever because he has to be yeah he has to be he's he's he measures 
if he stands on his hind legs and stretches, he might be eight inches tall. He's about four to six inches from nose to lung. Um, and he, therefore, has to be very sneaky, very clever. He is not a master of magic, but he's very good at using the magic that he knows and analyzing anything that he comes across and figuring out innovative ways to use things that he has the greatest effect. Or simply to trick people into thinking that one thing is going to happen when something else happens. He and Tobamar work really well as a team because they all, the enemy will end up focusing on Tobamar, giving Poplock a chance to uh, figure something out on his own. Ah, nobody suspects the intelligent Toad. <laughs> That's a, his tagline is fear me, and most people might laugh at that at first. Yeah. Hopefully at the end, they come to realize they shouldn't have been laughing at all. That's right. They're not laughing anymore. They might not even be breathing. If they're still alive. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so Poplock knows quite a lot about magic in Zarathan. Your magic seems like it. It feels logical. Feels like you've thought it out. Can you give us an overview of how magic works there and how it's connected with the gods? Is it basically all one or no? There's actually a lot of different powers, and magic itself has many different types. Yes, if you follow it to its ultimate source, all powers, magic, psionics, technology, all can coalesce to the ultimate power of creation and so on. But in any ordinary circumstance, they are quite separate powers. You know, it's sort of like um, electricity and electromagnetism and gravity. Uh, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong force, the weak force, they're all separate forces until you really get to the most basic level and then you can unify them, but in any practical terms, they're different things. So there's magic that uh, Poplock knows a fair amount about, which is, he knows some summoning magic, he knows he knows some what you would consider more normal magic, spell casting type magic. They, we get to see another kind of, a uh, couple of kinds of magic in Phoenix and Shadow, like gem calling. The magic, basically, magic can affect how reality functions. The normal laws of physics apply on Zarathan, but they can be shifted, changed, maneuvered by magic magic under certain circumstances. It requires a intelligent mind, a spirit, a soul, whatever you want to call it, to be able to use magic. That's how it sort of interacts with the gods, because the gods' power derives a lot from the power of the spirit. And this is actually the subject of a considerable lecture by one of the characters in Phoenix and Shadow. In great, uh, perhaps too much detail for his particular purposes, he may have said too much, so to speak. The fun of Poplock using the magic is that he always figures out something that a tricky use for it that that is surprising at least to me as a reader i was always oh that's cool yes um pop lock since he doesn't have too much magic thinks an awful lot about how to use what he's got and as he gets more he tries to fit that into his normal style again it's just his way of thinking i'm small i'm weak and i'm not human so i don't approach things the way that human beings do for one way or another and it doesn't mean that nobody ever ever thought of some of his tricks before in history but of course the chaos wars have this nice trait that if nobody's thought of it in the last few thousand years they won't remember it anyway <laughs> well tell us about the bad guys that they're these guys are facing uh one th one that's out, as it were, is the King of Hell. Uh, Kurlamian? All hell. King of all hell. All hells. All hells. Uh. Yeah, not just one. All hells. So all the, all the evil gods that have any afterlife whatsoever, they're in his... They're under him. So, you know, you, you know, uh, Hela, the, the goddess of the Norse underworld, any, any any dark, evil underworld ruling being, you can think of any demon, they're under him. He's the top of the heap. He's kind of cons consolidated evil into his own uh, corporation. Under his own. And yes, he's got a, it's like he's the emperor and they're all kings of their own countries, but they're all answered to him in the end. Well, we have a minion of his who's the main character, um, and we don't really, we're not sure who it is, um, and we're not even sure if this thing has a gender, probably doesn't. What can you tell us about that character without, we, 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 we're with him a lot in Phoenix and Shadow, but you managed not to reveal exactly who he is, but he's pretty evil, right? It's um, not, or he, not or he, she. Sorry, yes. He for a default, but keep in mind that uh, the word, the term used in the book is it. Right. I may say he occasionally, but it's it. It is. It uses the name, and other beings believe its name to be Viedraveria, which is the first son of Kalamion, the king of all hells. At the end of Phoenix in Shadow, it becomes clear that it may not be what people think it is, although the rest of the characters aren't going to know that. It is clearly manipulating everyone, even Kalamion. What its real goal is, is not clear at that point, and won't really become clear until toward the end of Phoenix Ascendant. But what it, it clearly focuses 
focuses on Kyrie and her group. It is clearly responsible. This much we learned even in Phoenix Rising. It is the one that really devised the plan that Kerlamion is using to try to conquer all of Zarephan, to bring the Dark City, the Black City there, to upset the rulership of all the other countries, to foment revolution and chaos in other places. All is part of a chaos war, which it obviously knows is coming and is using for this particular purpose. What is the Black City? Because it, it shows up. It's not just a mythical uh, thing from the past. No, the Black City is basically the capital of all hell. This is Carlanion's real home. Because of that bargain that was struck that we mentioned, where the gods can't interfere directly, the only other loophole that was in it was that the only gods that could directly act on Zarathan were ones that were physically incarnate on Zarathan naturally. He, by making his entire city part of Zarathan, steps through that loophole. Ah, see, I'm incarnate on Zarathan. My home's here, my city's here, so naturally I can act. And unfortunately, when when gods swear oaths, this is another very, very important aspect of the entire trilogy. A god cannot act against their nature, and they cannot act against an oath sworn upon the power of the gods. If they were to do so, the consequences are literally cataclysmic for them and possibly everyone connected. So the fact that he found the loophole, which obviously he planned on, or rather the being uh, that we were talking about, the one who called himself the Edravarion, had set up this plan with him. Um, by doing this, he's able to act on, on Zarathan and the others still can't, even though he's broken the spirit, but he has not broken the letter of the agreement, and there's nothing they can do about it. Yes. And, of course, the other thing is that because he has that, it's effectively a beachhead for almost unlimited troops of demons and other monstrous creatures that he has control of. There is uh, one one thing that we, we don't want to talk too much about is while all of this is the overstory that's going on, there is there is a, an evil that, uh, and quite a quite a um, strong, uh, let me see how I'm going to say it, <laughs> There's a there's a bad guy um, or a bad situation that Kyrie and, and her people confront. We don't give away what it is too much. So there is a resolution of that that evil um, in the in the book, and it's very cool. And it also involves some of the gods. This is kind of a Tobamar book in that way, isn't it? Yes, indeed it is. Uh, that's in fact one of the reasons why I, the, that's why the title is Phoenix in Shadow. There's two two meanings to that. One of them is, of course, that they were going into this place that was believed by them to be a terrible dark realm. But the other one is that Phoenix herself is now in the shadow of Tobomar for much of that book because this is where Tobomar com- completes his quest. And the, uh, the the dangers that they confront are at least as much drawn from Tobomar's people's past as they are from Kyrie's. Even though there uh, are three stages of that battle that you refer to and three separate threats, really, that have to be dealt with before you know, it's all finally settled. Well, the place that that, that they go is Moonshade Hollow, and we, we should talk about some of the monsters, which are cool. What kinds of monsters that, do they encounter? What, what are some of them? Well, the, they, they run to the, the first one they encounter, aside from some nasty, twisted trees. The whole area is filled with, and you know, again, without spoiling, there, it, there, there's, there's a corruptive force there that tends to twist normal things, even normal monsters, into being worse than they are. So you have even ordinary trees which become malevolent moving monsters. Um, the first thing that they encounter other than that is a creature called a Nelothroth, which is basically a gargantuan armored maggot. A very nasty um, thing. But at least that's a nice straightforward monster. It's a great big huge ugly thing it's going to try to eat and you're going to fight it. I think the nastiest thing that they encounter as a monster, uh, aside from the big thing that they encounter at the end, um, are the Itrichel. These are basically body stealing centipede insectoid things uh, with various mystical or psychic powers uh, that they and they use human or other young creatures to breed in and then dominate and turn into more slaves or carriers for them. They are intelligent, devious, and quite capable of trying to manipulate not just physical perceptions but uh, social ones to make sure that somebody else gets blamed for anything. They're doing and that darn near works. Uh, creepy. There's one other character that I found very compelling in the book, which is Condor. Uh, that's his uh, fi- his justicier name. He's a man in conflict. I- is he an Artan? I can't remember at the moment. He's purely human. He's purely human. He's, he's purely human. He, he's not a bad guy, 
he's just he, well, he is a bad guy. Explain a little bit about the the twisted logic that he's he's operating under without giving too much away. But I, I just like him as a character because he he it feels like there's hope for him possibly. Possibly to use a quote from an old stick song, he's a man whose circumstances went beyond his control. Condor was a child who uh, was orphaned during one of the false justice yards operations. One of the false justice yards, Shrike, could not bring himself to murder a child in cold blood. So he adopted the child and raised him. So Condor, whose name is Aaron, his real name is Aaron, was raised by Shrike as sort of the child kicking around Justice Yar's, the, the Justice Yar's retreat, which is their headquarters. Um, he was the, you know, the kid brother of all of them. And most of them, most of the Justice Yar's actually were originally not bad people. But that's one of the great tragedies of the Justice Yar's and one of the great mysteries of how these people end up being corrupted, um, which really isn't answered clearly until uh, the end of the third book. Um, but he was brought up with their basic principles, and since he was uh, around the regular people, um, they weren't telling him the secrets of the uh, society until he got much older and got inducted. He stayed mainly because at that point he knew too much and there wasn't much that he could do, and, and his father, effectively, Shrike, was part of it, and he couldn't betray Shrike. Then later on, when he starts to really think, well, why don't the two of us just get the hell out of here, that's when he gets really introduced to why you can't run away. He gets shown what's really behind all this. Then, when Kyrie finds out what's going on, eventually she's trying to confront the false justice yards, and naturally one of the ones she confronts is Shrike. Ironically, the reason she ends up killing Shrike is because Shrike suddenly realizes that she's decided maybe she could appeal to Condor's better nature and get him to switch sides. Shrike is too terrified of what will happen to his son if she does that, because he knows what's really behind this and doesn't believe that there's any way to defeat it. So he goes basically berserk, says he's, she's not, never going to get to him, and she's forced to kill him. Well, then she decides she's going to go on and contact someone else, and meanwhile, Condor comes across the body of his father, murdered and left there, and uh, left there, to, you know, his body sprawled out in the middle of the forest. The carefully maneuvered thing by our bad, by our real bad guy, the manipulator we were talking about earlier, makes sure that Condor doesn't know who Phoenix is. He knows there is a false Justice Yar, or rather a real Justice Yar, since he knows he's the false one, named Phoenix, and knows that Phoenix is responsible for the death of his father. So he swears vengeance to go after this Phoenix and exact you know, retribution upon him or her. So, yes, there is a certain logic to it, and in a sense, he's he's doing this, at least he's doing one thing for himself, when he's never before been able to act on his own. And as he goes on, he's more and more certain that what he wants to do in the end after he gets his vengeance is go and turn on the guy who did this to all of them. The, the mastermind behind it all. He really is, at heart, a good man and tries to be one despite the fact that he's working for a monster and his power is only given to him to perpetuate the monster's plans. Well, can you give us an idea of where the story is headed and in- Phoenix Ascendant? Are we going to understand uh, what, for instance, Koros might be up to? We will learn something of Koros's plans. You can think of Koros and our evil mastermind as being honorable adversaries. The two of them are playing a monstrous chess game um, across at least three worlds, maybe more. Um, and this sequence is just one part of that chess game. Where the story is headed, of course, is to the final confrontation between Phoenix and our chess master to find out what it really is, what its motives are, and, well, exact, hopefully, vengeance from it, because if uh, she doesn't succeed in doing that, obviously it's going to succeed in whatever it's after. If it succeeds, the stakes are much higher than she would realize. The stakes are nothing less than the lives of many of the gods. And even Nirianar, for reasons that won't become clear until that point, can't tell her what those stakes exactly are or why. Well, that sounds like I can't wait. What are you working on at the moment? Are we going to see more in the in the Boundary series that you've been doing with Eric? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, more than halfway through, I think, on Castaway Odyssey, the sequel to Castaway Planet, um, which I've uh, what I've done is I've done a second there's a second group of castaways. That's not really much of a spoiler since the end of Castaway Planet, they discover there must be somebody else there. So I spend the first part of the, the second book introducing this other group, which which are very different than the others, quite deliberately so, so you can see some people in different circumstances with different capabilities approaching the same problems and having to solve them in a different way. Then I've got a third book in the Arenaverse series, which uh, we mentioned 
mentioned earlier, challenges of the deeps. Uh, since uh, Bain right now wants me to temporarily at least wrap up that series, so I'm going to have to close off a bunch of, uh, you know, at least a few of the plot lines and uh, you know, give some closure there, which is which is cool. It means I'm going to be compressing two to three books into one, which in a way might be good because it will keep me from uh, getting the disease of, oh, let's just draw this thing out to, to get more books. And then I also have which I'll be working on about the same time. Princess Holy Aura, what we hope to be the first in the series, The Ethical Magical Girl. Honestly, I didn't expect you guys to take that one. When <laughs> I sent it to you, I was saying, this is the one that you guys are going to look at and say, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> um, I'm attempting to take what uh, anime fans know as the Maho Shoujo, or magical girl genre, and write a novel that both seri- takes it seriously and explores some of the more absurdity, absurd elements yeah. of the entire genre. But you love that stuff so much. It just, I, I mean, you're, you and, uh, you're really into it, right? I mean, it's... A... Well, the, I'm very much into anime in general. The Magical Girl series, I've enjoyed uh, some of them. I also enjoy looking at various uh, genres and saying, and what are the really cool parts of it, and what are the parts of it that just don't work? and how can I point up both simultaneously? And I just had this vision of a perfect way of doing it for Princess Holy Aura that I think really works to point up both sides of it, the serious and the absurd, uh, and so that I think if, if I do this right, I will have a book that is simultaneously quite funny and quite exciting and dramatic. It's a challenge, and I'm a little scared of it, in a sense, because it's one of those kinds of things that if it goes wrong, it will go terribly, terribly wrong. But I'm glad that I have a chance to do it. I'm really looking forward to it. I've written the first two chapters and letting them just sit there is something that will help me slide slide into doing it full bore once I finish off some of Castaway Odyssey. Well, I thought it was just super, a super cool idea and um, something that perhaps only you could pull off. So I think that's why Tony and I uh, landed on it. It was like, you know, if anybody can do this right, can do it. Well, I hope that I don't disappoint you. Oh, I don't think so. Forward to this, and I, and at the same time, I'm terrified of it, and I have no idea who would do the cover for it. <laughs> oh, we'll get somebody. Well, you know, it's. Uh, I, I don't want to get off on this too far, but uh, I was think it it might have similar cover to Win Spencer's uh, Eight Million Gods cover, and that was Thomas Kidd. So uh, maybe Tom Kidd. You know, we'll see. It's a very anime thing, so it would have to have some of that vibe because that oh yeah, Maho Shoujo is so anime. Yeah, well, that was uh, a million gods is is very anime too. As as a she loves that stuff. Anyway, let's stop talking about that. The book we're talking about is Phoenix and Shadow, which is the sequel to Phoenix Rising and book two in the Balanced Sword trilogy, and it's now available at booksellers everywhere. Uh, right, thanks very much for being with us. Uh, Thank you for being with me. I appreciate it, and let's uh, hope that this uh, one does well, because I, I'm so excited about it. I think it's a wonderful follow-up. Yeah, I think the third one you will find is better yet. At least that's <laughs> what all my data readers say. Well, it just keeps getting better, then. Excellent. So I'm open. It also does one thing that I've never seen another trilogy do. Each book in the series has been shorter than the last one. I'm not bloating. It's like it's going back in time. It's a miracle. Well, I think this one is a, is a great standalone novel. You could just dive in with Phoenix and Shadow. Uh, yeah, have a what went before so you can at least know who the heck these people are yeah and, it, and it's just it's got a great story so thanks a lot thank you have a good one and now here is another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of larry Correa's hard magic is read by bronson pinchot this portion of hard magic is provided by audible.com get the complete audiobook at audible.com now if you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Here's the setup for what's coming up. It's the 1930s in America, but it's an America that has been magically changed. In the 1860s, a handful of people from all walks of life were visited with special magical talents, and each generation more are so affected. These people are called actives. Most actives use their powers for good, but some don't. Jake Sullivan is a private eye. He's also a former soldier, an ex-con, and an active heavy, the type of active that controls the force of gravity. Jake is good at it. Jake has been recruited by a mysterious secret organization of actives, the Grim Noir, who are dedicated to seeing humanity through a possible magic-based apocalypse, an apocalypse that seems to be accelerating toward a terrible finale. 
Here is Bronson Pinchot with this portion of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. Chapter 26 We have tried everything. Bullets bounce off. Bombs thrown under his carriage have turned it to splinters and killed the horses, but don't so much as muss the chairman's hair. He does not sleep, so we can't sneak up on him. He does not eat, so we can't poison him. We've tried fire, ice, lightning, death magic, crushing gravity, bone shards, blood curses, all without effect. Decapitation might work if you could come up with a blade sharp enough, but the finest steel simply dulls against his skin. Even if you were to wield this modern Excalibur, the problem then would be that you can only touch Tokugawa if he lets you. He is all-knowing, all-seeing, moves faster than the wind, and can travel in the blink of an eye. You don't touch the chairman. The chairman touches you, and as far as we've observed, that only happens when he's ripping the very soul from your body. Frank Baum, Knight of the Grim Noir, Testimony to the Elders' Council, 1911 San Francisco, California it was Christopher Harkness, elder of the Grim Noir, who responded to the call of his ring. The thin man came into the hospital room, locked the door behind him, and Browning wondered why he'd never seen it before. Plague lived in his flesh. This was an angel of death. This was the pale horse. You called? Harkness answered. I did. Browning pulled the Colt forty-five out from under the blankets and leveled it at his fellow Grim Noir. I'm surprised you came. I'm bound by a sacred oath I had to come. He took a seat in one of the metal folding chairs next to the door. He did not look surprised to see the gun. You are, after all, one of my brothers. Isn't that... What the oath says, so I know you won't shoot me. I am still Grim Noir. I don't see a knight. I see a traitor. Harkness laughed. It was a hollow and joyless sound. Allow me the chance to explain myself before you murder one of your fellows. His awkward accenting of random words grated on Browning's ears. He reached very slowly into his coat. Mind if I smoke? The man standing before the firing squad is always allowed one. Do I get a blindfold? I'd prefer for you to see this coming. For I do believe you murdered John J. Pershing, and I would assume that even if they did not die by your hand, you are responsible for many other deaths. The pale horse struck a match and lit his cigarette. He took a long drag and let it out in a cloud. That would be correct, but not for the reasons you believe. You see, Mr. Browning, I... I am no traitor. I have accomplished that which has been considered impossible. I have accomplished the thing that has cost so many of our brothers' lives. I am the furthest thing from a traitor. I am a hero. Browning decided to hear him out. Then he would shoot him in the heart. Imperium Flagship Tokugawa Faye couldn't walk. Electrical shocks seemed to travel up her leg every time her foot touched the ground, but lucky for her, she didn't need to walk to travel. Time was short. Already the blue light was coming up out of the ocean. The magic jellyfish from the place with all the dreaming dead people was coming here right now. She appeared in the greenhouse where the surviving pirates had holed up. They were boxed in by two sets of Imperium marines, and they'd taken bad casualties. The woman that launched fire out of her hands was holding them back on one side, and the 
bald captain was shooting the soldiers that stuck their heads into the hallway, but they'd run out of bullets, fire, and luck before they'd run out of Imperium. The Imperium didn't even see her arrive right behind them. They were too worried about the fireballs that kept squirting down the corridor. So she pulled the pins out of two grenades, then traveled over to their friends on the other side and did that to them, too. She had appeared behind the pirates and had started talking before the soldiers had even exploded. Don't shoot, Faye shouted. I'm on your side, she glared at the fire lady. And don't you dare set me on fire again or you'll be sorry. Several guns turned on her, but at least they were smart this time. There were several explosions and then a moment later more from the opposite corridor. Okay, you're clear now. The pirate captain used the lull to shove another magazine into his rifle. Who are you? She waved her ring. Sir Fay of the Grimoire Knights. She didn't know if she was technically a sir like the knights she'd seen in that one picture book, as none of the other Grimoire ever called themselves sir, but she thought Sir Fay had a nice ring to it, but then again she was a girl. She'd ask Lance. He'd know. Never mind. You need to go down that way, up two flights of stairs, and then to the end of the boat. My friend Francis has a blimp waiting. You need to go now. What about the geotel? She rolled her eyes. Oh, you people always needing to know everything. She was very frustrated. She didn't have time to explain this to every single person she had to go rescue. Why did people have to be so difficult? She grabbed the two closest pirates and traveled. She dropped them at the rear end of the Tempest and then went back for more. The captain must have figured she was a bad guy who had just evaporated his men or something because he tried to shoot her, but she scooped him and a big fellow and dropped them with the others. Then she went back twice more. She was tempted to leave the fire lady. It had served her right for setting Faye on fire, but that was just the meanness talking, though Faye did leave her for last. She found a young man next to a crashed biplane. It was sticking out the top of the tallest structure on board. He'd crawled out and was hiding behind one wing. He'd already used up all the ammo from the big machine gun he'd pulled off his plane and was now shooting at Imperium with two fast-shooting pistols. His magic had something to do with changing how lucky stuff turned out, so he had shot bunches of them. She grabbed him by the back of the coat and dumped him with the other pirates, careful to point him out to sea since bullets were still leaving his gun when they traveled. She found UBF people from the Tempest and scooped them up too. Delilah was in the middle of a bridge in a place that was lit in red. She was curled up on her side in terrible pain. Next to her was a big, dead iron guard. She'd pulled his arm off and beat him to death with it. Fay landed nearby. She used the rail to steady herself. Delilah? Delilah looked up. Half her pretty face was gone and Faye could see her skull. Leave me alone. I'm almost out of power. Then I won't be able to stand it. I'm sorry, Delilah. This whole place is about to explode. She put her face down so that Faye could only see the pretty side and smiled. Good. She understood. Bye, Delilah. Faye traveled. Heinrich and Mr. Garrett were being chased by a bunch of zombies. At least they were smart enough not to argue when she showed up, and they'd be smart enough to explain to the others what was going on, so that gave her an idea. The three of them landed deep in the steaming guts of the Tokugawa. An Imperium torch took two steps toward them, but Mr. Garrett shot him twice in the chest and once in the forehead. The thing she wanted to show them was behind a big, wheezing, stinky machine. The Avi, Heinrich asked. Look at this. Faye cringed as she limped and led them behind the machine. A really complicated design had been engraved into the wall. She didn't think the other's eyes could see what her gray ones could, but she could see the energy connected from the big evil magic super bomb right to these markings. What strange geometries, Garrett said, running his hands over them. He pulled them away as if he'd been shocked. It's from the Rune Arcanium. It's a beacon, but that doesn't make any sense. I don't understand. There wasn't time. You'll figure it out. She grabbed them both and took them up to the Tempest. There was a big crowd there now. Mr. Garrett blinked in surprise, his hand still extended. 
He looked to Fay, biting his lip as the wheels turned. The entire night sky had turned a brilliant blue. Black storm clouds were boiling away around the energy. The Geotel. About time somebody got it, Fay shouted. You're smart. You've got the words I don't make them understand. Mr. Garrett grabbed her by the arm. I can't leave without Jane. I'll get her, she cried a little as her foot hit the ground. That's what she got for being in one place for too long. Francis, are you ready yet? He came running, a metal pail in hand, filled to the brim with bits of metal and glass. I did like you said. Good. Listen, Mr. Garrett, tell Lance. He's smart, too. Get in the air. We'll wait for you, Heinrich said. No, get in the air. Since she was supposed to be the uneducated hick, it was frustrating how much slower everyone else's brain was. We can catch up, but whoever put that mark down there didn't realize how smart the chairman is. He'll figure out what's going on real soon if he hadn't already. I've got to stop him. From what? Francis asked, confused. Firing the geotel? No, from shutting it off. She grabbed Francis's shirt. Let's go. What am I supposed to do with this junk? You'll figure it out. Sullivan stood defiant in a vast puddle of blood, surrounded by deadly iron guards and the most dangerous man on earth. Strong wind blew through the broken windows. The geotel was lighting the room in a stark cold blue, but it was no longer necessary because the world outside had brightened considerably. The chairman stood. It is done. A great man has been defeated. He will be missed. But the strongest survives. So that's what it comes down to? Survival of the fittest? The chairman nodded. As always, I would offer you a place in my service. It is my sincere belief that you could take more kanji upon you than even your brother. You could be the greatest wizard of all, perhaps come to rival even me. Together we could even defeat the ancient enemy so that the power could stay forever. His face grew melancholy. Yet... As I read your thoughts, you would fight me to the last. Sullivan shrugged and spit half a tooth on the floor. Whatever. You sum up so much philosophy in so few words. I wish that we could have been friends, Mr. Sullivan. He walked over to the geotel, his bare feet crunching through the broken glass. Would you at least watch the end of the old world and beginning of the new with me? I would very much like to share it with someone who can appreciate such things. You've got no right. No right at all to remake the world in your image. You're going to kill millions. Millions is nothing. If only you could understand what is at stake. I thought you might, but I am disappointed. He was honestly saddened. Lonely. The chairman watched the ocean. The night sky had turned an electric blue. The iron guards shifted nervously, all of them ready to kill Sullivan. Interesting. When the pillar of fire appeared in Tunguska, did the air over Wardenclyffe also become so charged? Unknown, chairman, one of the unit 731 cogs answered. The geotel is one end of the circuit, so perhaps our observers at Tesla's lab were murdered by the Grim Noir when they took the geotel, so we do not know. And the second time, when the geotel was almost fired, the sky over New York turned blue, but the geotel was close to the target geometry. It is possible that the sky is lightened both where the power is provoked and where the power is unleashed. The chairman nodded thoughtfully. Yet something feels wrong. Has the energy gathered over the target in New York? Have we word from our spies in America? No, chairman, a different cog responded. I will prepare a mirror. Okuba Tokugawa grasped his hands behind his back. 
Sullivan could tell he was using his power to feel the surroundings, much like he did himself when the world faded into its component bits and their corresponding gravitational forces. The chairman stepped away from the window. I am too close to the device. It is disrupting my magic. I can't see anything. What do you wish us to do? A cog asked. The sky had lightened even more. It was brighter than noon. The ocean below was glowing hideously. The chairman scowled. Shut it down, he ordered. The cog started to protest. But, chairman, that could damage the sensitive... He held up one hand. Yes, chairman. The cog bowed, realizing that he'd gone too far in daring to disagree. He took a step toward the geotel, then froze, looking over Sullivan's shoulder. The cog's mouth began to form a warning, but then his head jerked violently to the side. Brains splattered the chairman's simple robes. Jane was holding up Sullivan's forty-five. The chairman glanced over at the healer. I did not see that coming, he said as Jane shot him. Take that, you bastard. She dumped the rest of the magazine into the grand leader of the Imperium. He appeared mildly amused as the bullet struck. Sullivan had nothing to lose. He surged forward as the chairman raised his finger to blast Jane into oblivion. Three iron guards intercepted him, simultaneously buffeting his body with fire, ice, and electricity. Hi! a voice cried from the other end of the great room. Every head turned, and Sullivan was surprised to see Fay and Francis. The girl hurled a bucket through the air, spilling tiny reflective bits behind it. Francis was concentrating hard. Sullivan instinctively threw himself to the ground. The air hummed with movement as hundreds of fragments zipped through the room. Francis didn't just send them out. He whipped them back, using his power to fling them at terrible speeds around and again. Iron guards screamed as bodies were pierced. The icebox at his right jerked as a piece of wire zipped through him, and the crackler at the left threw his hands to his neck to stop the spray of arterial blood. Then Sullivan was looking up into a pair of gray eyes as Fay dropped his missing body right into his lap. This might help, she shouted. I'm gonna go protect the geotel. The crazy traveler girl had gotten it backwards, but whatever. Sullivan rolled over and started shooting iron guards. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Hard Magic by Larry Correa, read by Bronson Pencho. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, thanks to Bain intern Christopher Ricci, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz, and a swampy chorus of croaking hallelujahs to Reich E. Spohr, author of Phoenix in Shadow. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>